Great. Hi. Hi. My name is Poyo. I'm Nicola. And we're going to talk about uh, the DebCom video team. So uh, all the wonders of uh, how to set up uh, things, how our gear works, um, all the funny bits you've missed because uh, you weren't there at midnight last night. <laughs> all these kind of things that are great working on the video team. So what's the video team? Uh, we're the annoying people that tell you to stand up and wait for the microphone. Um, so what we do is we record the events uh, of the Debian community and we record all the conference presentations. Uh, we allow through streaming uh, the participation of people who couldn't come to the event, so we allow remote participation. And we try to have tons of fun working towards a fully free software and hardware uh, conferencing <coughs> video stack. Yeah, we're, we're like 90% there. Yeah, pretty much. So uh, the Depcon video team has lots and lots and lots of people. Uh, the people on this slide are kind of the core of the video team. Uh, members, some of them are here, some of them aren't. Um, but the video team wouldn't be able to work without the dozens and dozens of volunteers uh, that help us at conferences. Uh, so thanks to everyone who helps with the video stuff. And also thanks to the sponsors because um, the recordings that we do, uh, the hardware that we buy, uh, the resources that we use uh, wouldn't be here without Debian sponsors. So thanks a lot to all the sponsors of Debian. Yeah. And to Debian for buying all the stuff. Yeah, sure. Right. Yeah. So do you want to do Yeah, the system sure. Overview? So system overview. Um, oh, the microphone is dropping. Yeah. Anyway, see? fun with the video stuff. Uh, so the system overview, our system is quite complicated and we normally um, divide it between uh, audio and video, but if you can and see here in the projector, um, basically uh, our audio is um, all geared with the mixer that is in the back of the room here. Uh, we have multiple microphones, we have four microphones in total. Uh, so that is uh, two, uh, headsets. two headsets mm -hmm. and then two hand microphones that are all wireless. Um, so there's a bunch of cables uh, going all through the room for this. Uh, and then there's a video. We have two cameras per room. So at, at larger conferences like DevConf, what we normally do is we have multiple rooms. So uh, in a single room like this, we're going to have two cameras. The first one is... Um, yeah. I'm gonna use a microphone that works. So the first, the first camera. Um, <laughs> fun with the video team. Uh, so the, the, the first camera, uh, the first camera is uh, to record a presenter, and then the second one gives us a second shot on the audience for questions. Uh, it's all. It also allows for more dynamic recording of uh, people talking, yeah. so you don't only have one one camera taking things. And these cameras uh, are both wired to a video mixing console. So it's a PC, basically, with two capture cards uh, that I used uh, for capturing the video. And we also capture the presenter's laptop. So uh, if you see the podium here, I have a HDMI cable that goes out from my laptop. And through a mess of cables and equipment, uh, this goes uh, to a box that converts the signal uh, and allows us to get it on stream as well. Uh, I think that's uh, yes. pretty much what we have for, for the overview, yeah. this overview. So yeah, so a uh, close-up of the video recording equipment. Uh, that's one of our cameras. Um, so we got uh, decent, very decent camcorders. Uh, we got them in 2017. Uh, so we have six camcorders, which allows us to record three rooms uh, with a consistent setup, and they are uh, 4K SDI output, uh, SDI recording uh, camcorders. Uh, we only use the digital output uh, that goes, uh, that fits into the capture PC. Yeah, we don't, the cameras are 4K ready, but we don't record in 4K for technical reasons. Um, the footage is really, really large, and uh, our mixing PC couldn't handle it. 
So we're recording in 720p for the moment. Yeah, I think there's been uh, quite a lot of improvements uh, on the software stack. Uh, I know, for instance, that the CCC records in full, full HD now. Uh, so, yeah, but like 720p for conference video is pretty good. Uh, well, at least we consider it pretty good. Uh, we also have uh, two tripods, so the two tripods allow us uh, to have like a full set of hardware to record miniconfs. Uh, when we need more, uh, when we want to record free rooms, uh, we hire uh, some uh, hardware. Uh, we have tally lights, uh, so tally lights allow the camera operators to see that uh, their camera is on stream, so there's a light that goes on when the camera is enabled. Uh, they're basically a serial, um, like it's just an LED that uh, gets activated by the DTR line on a, a serial uh, RS-232 connection. So we can extend the run uh, for very long with just a few RG45 adapters. So we have a Cat5 Ethernet port uh, cable that runs all the way through the room. For the audio, um, we have, uh, so we've renewed the equipment for the audio uh, setup uh, this year. Uh, we got a new mixing desk uh, with more inputs than what we had. Uh, we have also new microphones and receivers. Uh, so basically, uh, it's, um, so thanks to Fledermouse for uh, sponsoring us uh, the mixing desk and Debian gave us the rest of the audio equipment. So, as we said, two headsets, two handheld microphones, and four receivers for uh, all of that. Sadly, um, these receivers have certain frequency, and they're not. We couldn't take it, for example, and bring it to US, or um, because certain countries in the world have laws on radio frequency. So these receivers are blocked for a certain frequency and they all changed it depending on different countries. Right. So we decided on this one, this setup, because um, most mini comms are in Europe, so this works for the greater Europe and these kind of things. But if you we went to the US or like in, in Asia mm. for a mini conference, we, sh we would have to hire some more gear for that. Yeah. Um, wireless regulations around the world are a pain in the ass. So, yeah. Uh, and so we've put uh, most of the audio recording gear uh, inside a um, flight case that we can take, so we can just roll it around, and it's uh, pretty much all in one place. We used to have like a pile of uh, a pile of smaller flight cases. It was quite a mess to ship everything around. So it's I think we've streamlined to four packages and two tripods, which is kind of, it's okay, it's, uh, <laughs> it's manageable. So the way we capture the presentator's laptop is through uh, a project called uh, HDMI to USB. Yeah. And it uses, uh, yeah. I don't know how it works. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it, it uses a board called the Numato Opsys, which is open hardware, and, and it has, isn't it? Yeah, 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 it, it is. is. <coughs> yeah. And um, it, it has a FPGA inside. So uh, the HDMI to USB is a project we flash on it. And what it does, it has uh, two inputs and two outputs for HDMI. So you could input two, two different inputs and then use the outputs. And it has a um, USB output afterwards. And we take this USB output and put it in the, the recording PC. So it gives us basically a way to capture what the presenter has. And we need... Uh, multiple outputs because one of the outputs is going to, uh, to the projector in the room. So we, we're using this matrix board uh, to be able to record. So it's, re it's really nice because we have one output going to the projector and we have one output going to the screen in front. So we can look at the screen in front and kind of peek at the audience rather than turning around like I've been doing for the start of the talk. So yeah. I'm going to try to actually yeah. stay <laughs> and right this, this project I mean we're we've been using that project for a while and at the beginning it wasn't the most stable project but uh, it's it's really it's really good it's really improved and mm -hmm. nowadays we basically don't have any problems with it uh, and it's a really solid project so yeah thumbs up sort of folks it's 
HDMI to USB. Yeah. Uh, and so this, uh, so basically, this device presents a webcam uh, over USB. And so we have a uh, SBC, a single board computer, uh, plugged into it. Uh, it's a MinoBoard Turbot, so it's, uh, I think it's an Intel Atom yeah, based uh, yeah. system. Uh, fanless, pretty nice, tiny. Uh, it all fits in a one U case. Uh, so this largish case, uh, I I think I have a picture of the case, uh, of the inside of the case, and it's like one board, one tiny board, and then lots of space. Like we had space to put a switch and lots of stuff inside. So it's kind of tiny, and it's, it's nice. For the live recording, uh, for the live mixing of uh, the presentations, uh, we use a desktop PC. Uh, basically, uh, this desktop PC is connected through the network uh, with the uh, presenter slide capture PC, and it's connected with SDI to the two cameras. So it needs a fairly big CPU. Uh, we've managed to make the system work uh, with lower end i5s, I think, uh, last year uh, in Taiwan. Uh, it wasn't great. We had to, like, shrink down the previews and stuff to, to keep the CPU use okay. But with this machine, we can have full size previews, and it's, it's pretty nice. Um, the raw bandwidth needed for uh, multiple streams coming from the cameras is quite high. So to mix these then with a live mixer, it takes quite a lot of resources. And so this, uh, this computer is also used as a NAT gateway so that all the computers that are on the video network can access the internet through any kind of uh, uplink that uh, the venue might provide. So for instance, here, uh, the uplink is a very long uh, cable run that goes to a switch that goes to another room through a window. It's, uh, it's a bit messy. But we only need one network drop, and then we're uh, self-sufficient uh, on the network. So we can uh, kind of make do with any situation that a venue can throw at us. Uh, and yeah, it works well. For the live mixing software, we're using, uh, we're using something called Voctomix. Uh, it was written by the, the folks at the CCC, yeah. so the CCC VOC team. Uh, it's great. It's, it's built in Python. It's all in Debian. Mm -hmm. um, what to say? So uh, when, you look at the, when you look at the mixing software, uh, which is this window on the left, you have the two camera inputs and the slide, uh, a slideshow input, uh, and then you have a preview of the uh, live mixed uh, version. Um, so this is the GUI for the desktop that we use uh, over there. And here you, we put a few previews of the actual stream so we can make sure that we see, uh, that we actually stream uh, stuff. And we've also, uh, so we have, we communicate on IRC. Uh, the team communicates on IRC. And so the, uh, the director has a window open on IRC so, it can, so they can get feedback from uh, either the audience or camera operators or anyone else that might have something interesting to say. Um, for instance, here uh, people are talking about the scheduling for the next sessions, I guess, <laughs> in the, this window. And on the bottom left here is just a view of the recordings so we can make sure that the recordings are enabled and keep like recording. Uh, I personally lost half a day of recordings because there was no recording, so we've added that uh, since. It's always a good thing to check that you're actually recording something. Yeah. So yeah, Voctomix, all packaged in Debian, thanks to the C3 VOC for building it. It's great. Live streaming, uh, I guess that's my uh, area of expertise. Uh, so uh, basically, this um, mixing software outputs a raw uh, video feed uh, that we need to put somewhere, push somewhere. So what we do is in every room uh, we have, so this mixing PC is pushing using RTMP. So we encode in uh, X26, uh, H264 and AAC the feed and we push it through RTMP to a streaming backend, which uses NGINX uh, with the RTMP module. Uh, 
uh, RTMP is the like industry standard for pushing uh, real-time uh, audio and video feeds. And the RTMP module basically uh, slices the uh, video and puts it into the HTTP live streaming format, or HLS, uh, which is a standard-ish uh, thing that was developed by Apple uh, originally, and then like, it became the industry standard for streaming on the web. So what the HLS format is, is basically a playlist of chunks of uh, video and audio uh, that you that you have to put in a HTTP directory. So for the client, you just have to do HTTP requests on a loop uh, to the playlist and open the slices uh, one by one and play that. Um, what we have for the front end is basically HTTP caching. We don't need anything more than uh, just a HTTP cache because it's just a plain directory. So it's, it's really easy to actually distribute front ends around the globe to uh, reduce the latency for the player. Um, so we, we do uh, nice stuff like downscaling the stream. So basically the central streaming backend also runs FFmpeg on the incoming stream to uh, lower the... So it creates downscale versions with lower quality, lower bandwidth requirements, and HLS allows you to uh, have adaptive uh, streaming. So you can adapt, the client can adapt the files that it's going to get according to the bandwidth that it actually has. So this allows streaming uh, all around the world, uh, even for low bandwidth, uh, like remote attendees. It's a... Uh, it's worked, I think, somewhat better than what we had before. We used to use um, iCast too. Yeah, iCast. Uh, um, uh, what was the protocol? Uh, yeah, I see the lights blinking. <laughs> <laughs> Which is annoying. Anyway, uh, so Nginx uh, RTMP module, it's packaged in Debian. Uh, it's uh, in the stable backports and it's going to be in the, in the next release as well. So, pretty cool. Uh, Fosdem actually uh, is really happy that we packaged uh, Nginx RTMP module <laughs> because they needed it, they used it, but they had to package it themselves. So we actually uh, collaborated with them to make sure that it was included inside the Debian Nginx package. So Fosdem actually uses these packages now as well, which is pretty cool. So yeah, geographic distribution uh, with, uh, so we don't use uh, GeoDNS, we use uh, GeoIP on the server side. So basically when you connect to uh, the server, it can redirect you to the appropriate front end. Uh, usually in MediaDebConf, we only have one front end because there's like a smaller audience than there is uh, at DebConf and there's uh, a lower setup time. So we don't do the whole shebang of having uh, 20 front ends <laughs> and <laughs> everything. It works okay. Uh, the front ends is just like something fancy. Uh, I think Fosdem really, do, really uses their front ends because they have a lot of remote attendance. Uh, it's less of an issue for us. Uh, so we have direct access to the uh, DNS zone, uh, thanks to our friends at DSA. So we can just push our changes and we are autonomous on that area as well, which is nice. So once the video have been recorded, uh, one thing we do afterwards is to review them uh, before publication. So the system we're using is called S-Review. It's been written by uh, Walter, which is a, a member of the video team. It's also in Debian. Um, so basically, uh, S-Review manages preview generation, uh, you can start. You can you can manage the, the the start and the end of the video. So, for example, if we started late, then uh, we're going to need to adjust when exactly to start the start the talk started and then when it ended, um, and then it cuts the video, it transcodes it, and uh, it archives it for us. Uh, it also uh, we import the schedules of all the conferences we're going to uh, in S Review, and then S Review manages metadata, so we can have some metadata afterwards for the videos. It's useful, for example. Uh, we're going to talk about it later, but we're uploading also our videos to YouTube, for example. So that gives us some, some, data, some metadata to have 
uh, to upload there. Um, this system is also used by FOSDEM, and the, the idea behind it is for it to be as easy as possible to review talks. Um, for example, FOSDEM, what, what they do is that they ask the, the presenters to actually review the talks themselves. Uh, we do it ourselves to, because we have a large team of volunteers to do it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the talks are recorded, they're transcoded, uh, where do we put them? So we have a meetings archive, uh, it's, so the main uh, meetings archive is a FTP server. Uh, so basically it's a bunch of files on an FTP server, which is kind of a git annex repo, but sometimes we don't uh, update the metadata, and well, whatever. Uh, so there's a random mix and match of files, there are videos, there are subtitles, there are slides. Um, so over the past few years, uh, we've tried to actually uh, fix this mess and have a new Git repository with metadata for all the files that are in the archive. So this repository and this, these tools, they scan the metadata that's provided by the conferences. So if there's a, if there's a schedule uh, that's been written in machi machine-readable format, they can scan that and ingest the metadata. And this metadata can be used to build a proper front-end for uh, the DebCon video archive. So we've had people uh, looking at Peertube. Uh, Tafrir has built a Kodi plugin for it as well. Uh, so yeah, it, it's a uh, it's a work in progress. Eventually, yeah, we'll have a, a really nice front-end. A fancy front-end with uh, all our videos. If you're really good with web stuff, then talk to us. And, and uh, yeah, <laughs> the, the next thing that we do is that we've come to the conclusion that uh, whatever you do, uh, whatever you say, people will randomly upload your videos to YouTube. So we might as well do it ourselves properly with high quality videos that we control with good metadata uh, and making sure that uh, we have like a proper YouTube channel uh, for our videos. Uh, unfortunately, that's where a lot of the viewership is. So, well, we might as well do it. So this is this was kind of the first user of the metadata repository. Uh, we have a new pile of scripts that <coughs> generates and uploads the videos to YouTube from the metadata repository. So you can have a look at our channel if you, if you do YouTube. One of the things that are great with YouTube is that it, it automatically generates uh, closed captions. Yeah. So it's a thing we try to do, but it's, it takes a lot of time and effort to do. Uh, so most of the time it's okay. Yeah, most, uh, I mean, the manual, manually done captions are way better yeah. than the automated stuff, but the automated stuff cost zero uh, to make, so it's a, it's a compromise. And it's, I, it's sometimes funny because it has trouble recognizing like different the accents. Language. Yeah. So sometimes, for example, somebody speaking with, in English with a German accent, then it subtitles everything in, in German while the person is speaking in English. It's, it's pretty funny. Machine learning, right. Um, the future. Our setup is done entirely through, and so, uh, we try to automate all the setup that we do. Uh, it serves two purposes. It allows us to have a repeatable setup and it allows us to document the setup and show uh, what kind of crazy hacks we had to do to make things work. So uh, basically we have two uh, layers uh, of automatic setup. We have a Pixie server uh, which we use uh, for Debian installer preceding. So this is just a stub of configuration to be able to start running Ansible uh, on the installer machine. So we have a full repository uh, with uh, Ansible playbooks, uh, roles, tasks, uh, the whole shebang uh, on our uh, Git repositories. Yeah. So for example, when we need to set up for a big conference when we have multiple machines, the first step is going to be building the PXE server, and then we can boot machines from there one after the other, specifying uh, an IP address, and it will build automatically the machines depending on the different roles we have. And so uh, the setup of the Pixie server is scripted as well, yeah. so we, like, we can just run script, it creates a USB installer. And, uh, so it, it makes it. for easy install for a bunch of different machines with different types of roles and different capabilities, and uh, it works pretty well. Yeah, it's, uh, it's all right. So everything is documented in... Um, in your repository, you can go and visit uh, its video.debconf.org. It's all bid with Sphinx, uh, which is the same. Let's read the docs. If, 
Um, it also, but this website has a live player for the mini devcoms. So for different conferences where people don't want to build a whole website, website for yeah. the mini conf, uh, people can just go there and watch a live stream directly. Um, we have uh, two separate documentation pages, one, one for the uh, yeah. actual Ansible documentation, so, and then one for our general setup and like what the hardware we use and some diagrams uh -huh. and these kind of things. So we have yeah, manual documentation and Ansible specific documentation basically in two, uh, two separate websites. Uh, so this is a large mess, and so there's a lot of changes uh, uh, to making it work, and we've kind of picked up a few lessons along the way. So yeah, uh, Ansible is great, but having a loose team of 10 people working on Ansible when we meet like five, <laughs> six times a year is kind of hard. Uh, and one of the things we, we, we did to make that easier is to start using Salsa, so get the GitLab uh, uh, repository of uh, Debian and uh, using a merge request based workflow. So it's really, it's way better. So we, we now create merge requests, ask somebody to review them, see if it's okay. Whereas when we were using Alioth, we were just pushing to master and then expecting things to work. Yeah. Uh, we're also using continuous integration. So we have a different sets of, uh, uh, of tests, tests yeah. running uh, through GitLab CI on Salsa. Uh, we're using the Docker executor, and uh, we're using Ansible lint first to lint the code to see if we made some stupid mistakes or if something is going to be deprecated in Ansible because uh -huh. things tend to change. And then each test, uh, each role is tested individually um, to see if it works. Uh, and sadly, one of the big problems we have is that systemd and Docker and GitLab CI is not really, it doesn't work. There's no way to make it work, uh, at least from what I know, I, I worked like a bunch of time on this. So we just skipped the system, the tasks, and uh, expect them to work. Yes. So I messed up. This image should be uh, on the previous slide. Uh, this shows uh, in a very, very thin <laughs> and very gray on gray font uh, the actual uh, roles that we are testing. So yeah, the, there's a bunch of stuff that we test. Uh, it's, it's pretty nice. So uh, one of the big issues that we have is that we have a lot of specific custom hardware, and it's really hard to emulate it. Uh, and even then, uh, it's also not that easy to uh, have, uh, like, for instance, if we want to test the video mixing software, it's hard to have like virtual sources that allow us to do an integration test of our system. So we haven't really found uh, a good way to do, uh, to do that yet. Uh, some people have starting play, started playing with like uh, automating setup of KVM machines to actually replicate the network setup and some of the injection stuff. It's, um, again, if you want a, fun, a fun challenge uh, with a complicated setup, might be something you can help us with. Documentation is a, is a challenge. It's a technical challenge because, uh, well, as you've, as you've seen through our talk, our setup can be quite complicated. So one of the things we, we learn and encourage people to do with these kind of setup is actually set up good documentation using uh, known platforms like Sphinx yeah. to help you link pages and tell you what to do. And uh, especially in a project like this where we have to build like the system five times in a year and mm. we're not touching it the other times. So yeah, the, the hardware is in a, in a, in a shelf, uh, on a shelf in my office, maybe 85, 90% of the time. Uh, it goes out maybe across a whole year, one month, one month and a half. So yeah, it's kind of hard to actually make sure that uh, we don't forget stuff and so. Yeah, and then the number of events that we cover is slowly increasing. Uh, I think this uh, month is uh, quite impressive. Uh, I did a Ubuntu party last week with this setup. We're doing the mini demconf this week, and in two weeks there's a new mini demconf in Hamburg. And so this is a great thing. Uh, there's more and more distributed Debian events uh, around around Europe, uh, Debian or otherwise events. Uh, but sometimes it's hard to just find people to cover all these events because uh, we're not all lucky enough to get 
a lot of time off of work uh, and travel is uh, exhausting and, and stuff. So training is becoming a very big part of uh, like training is a big challenge because it's um, like doing the setup uh, with uh, very seasoned team members is quite fast. Uh, you know what to do, you're focused, you, you go really fast. Uh, when you have to tell people what you're doing, explain everything, uh, it takes a lot more time. Uh, I can just do a comparison. Uh, the setup that I did uh, by myself last week took maybe three hours. Uh, the setup that we did here uh, with new volunteers took a whole day. And that's okay, uh, but it's time consuming and we need to like account for it. And if we don't train people, the quality of the videos and of the recordings fall dramatically. So we have to do it and we know we have to do it. And so we're, we're really happy to have like trained a new batch of, uh, of people that are going to do great work in Hamburg, I think, next in two weeks. And many finally last, last yeah. technical challenge we're having is uh, unexpected problems at venues. So we have to build the whole system in a few hours sometimes. So sometimes you have things like here, for example, we had a faulty ground loop. And what it does, it, it goes bzzz on, on the audio recordings. So it's quite, it's quite troublesome. Um, sometimes you have restricting fire, firewalls. So you arrive at a venue and then you find out that half of the ports you need are closed and it's Friday night and the network admin are gone till Monday. So you have to deal with that somehow. Uh, sometimes uh, we arrive in a, a place like, uh, for example, in Taiwan last year. Yeah. Uh, we ended up in a room where they told us that there was a, sp a PA system with speakers. Yeah, there's a, there's, a full, uh, there's a full audio system in the room and you arrive and you find this, this shit. <laughs> So and that's it. Yeah, there was that was it in the room. There was the mixer and the speakers together in a time, <laughs> tiny, yeah. tiny, tiny, small box for I, a large room. I, I don't even think there was a XLR input on that. It was just a mini jack that you could plug your phone in or something. So yeah, it was. Uh, so lucky for us, we had uh, someone with a full audio <laughs> setup in the back of his van, uh, parked at the university, so we could do that. And well, one last thing: uh, shipping. Uh, all this hardware is uh, complex. It's not hard. Uh, it's just like uh, there's a lot of boxes and you have to know where everything goes. And we ship around the world because uh, the hardware went to, uh, well, at least the hardware that I managed went to South Africa, then uh, Canada, then Taiwan. And it's going to go to Brazil <laughs> next year. Well, this summer. Uh, it's gonna have to go to Israel. Uh, so, yeah, you kind of start to understand how the world's import duty system works and um, how uh, you get to rent a van in random places around the world. <laughs> it's, fu it's fun, it's actually quite good fun. So help is always welcome. If you wanna be part of the video team, we're here. We're happy to train people. Uh, you can subscribe to our mailing list, or find us on RSC in the debconf-video team channel. Uh, and if one of the things we're failing to do is actually subtitles. So if, if you want to work on subtitling talks, it's a great uh, talk to us. We can help. Uh, yeah. We can help put you in touch with the right people yeah. that know how to do it, because I certainly don't. But I yeah. know where to find the people who do. So <laughs> we, we, can, we can root for you. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it for our talk. So. Uh, we have, I guess, 10 minutes for questions. Uh, five, 10 minutes. No, no, we don't. No, no. We set that timer to 35 minutes to get time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> the video team knows. <laughs> I mean, I think it's OK, but uh, all right. So yeah, there's a microphone in the middle of the room if you want to. Uh, please ask a question. Please, please use the microphones. Yes. <laughs> well, one of the reasons we're asking people to use the microphones is because if you don't use the microphones, then uh, people on the stream won't hear you. So. Yeah. 
we kind of have like two uh, microphones uh, over the room that can pick up ambient noise and if you push the gain really high up then you can hear someone shouting across the room but we try to avoid it because it's way better to actually get a clear voice through the microphone but if everything was clear then i guess we can go have some more coffee before yeah, yeah, i have a question oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> have you ever used or tried or compared the the mixing with obs open broadcast something is it different is it better is it i've touched OBS once, uh, it's, uh, it's quite different. I think Stefano has done most of I think OBS. OBS. I guess it's better for streaming different yeah. outputs live. And, and it, it's mostly it geared to people having a, maybe a simpler setup, like they, they want a uh, just one, lap no, one laptop and different cameras or it's screen grabbing. And I don't think it's that true. I don't know. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen people with very complex setups like uh, a side cam, a face cam, a capture of their uh, huge gaming laptop. Uh, yeah, OBS can handle that. The way I'd answer that is OBS is really well suited to someone who wants a custom setup that they're going to build for their stream, yes. where we want something that's repeatable and every room has exactly the same setup that's automatically configured and gives the um, operator as few options as possible. Yeah. We don't want them having to go and figure out how to add a new camera. Right. Uh, I'm not sure if I understood. Is all the is are the multi streams coming from the venue or are they split from an external server? Because that would change the bandwidth requirements, and maybe you don't always have enough bandwidth to have four streams from the venue. So um, we've never. So um, the output bandwidth requirement is, I think, two or three megabits per second, uh, so it's, sorry? Configurable as well. It yeah, is and it's configurable, configurable. Yeah. so yeah, we can, uh, we can actually push down the bandwidth requirement uh, if, if we need to. Uh, usually when we're streaming several rooms uh, at DebConf, uh, we've asked the venue to get a very decent internet connection because that's actually needed for the work that happens at DebConf, uh, regardless of the video team. Uh, so I don't think we've had like issues uh, with bandwidth, like with pushing our streams outside. Uh, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> one issue we had in Taiwan, uh, we actually had the streaming uh, backend server inside the university, and it was uh, open uh, for the uh, front ends to talk to, and the university firewall. Uh, thought that the front ends were dosing the uh, back end server, so the connections were shut off. Um, so I, I think we uh, uh, it was during the week, and so we managed to get a hold of a network admin to turn off the DOS protection on that machine. And we like we maybe lost 10 minutes of streaming because of DNS TTL pointing the stuff at another server. But yeah, uh, mostly over ZDUS firewalls are more of a problem than uh, actual bandwidth requirements. So for bandwidth, you need only two to three megabits, not even megabytes per second? Yeah, I'm pretty sure, that's it. Per room, yeah. <laughs> what was wrong with your microphone in the talk, Nicola? Uh, I have no idea. I uh, think, I think. <laughs> We haven't changed the batteries before starting. Uh, we have yeah. changed the batteries yesterday night because I did. Um, no, I, I see the um, receiver light flickering. I, it did it yeah. right now. Um, I think there might be interference between uh, the channels of two or four microphones uh, <laughs> because the lights are flickering like in sequence. Uh, so yeah, oops. <laughs> As an organizer, I have to say that it was very, very pleasant to work with you guys. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot for organizing great events all the time. It's, it's cool to be around. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe time for one more question. Yeah, if you have last one, make it count.
If not, we can get more coffee before the next talk. Yeah, that works. <laughs> Thanks a lot. See you. Bye.